everyone, welcome to Monaco. We are at Lisa Seas, one of Europe's biggest cybersecurity forum. And if it feels like 2017 is a banner year for cyber attacks, well, that's because it is. Almost 2 billion records were lost or stolen globally in the first half of 2017. That's an increase of 164% over the previous semester. In the last month, we've learned of a data breach from credit agency Equifax and a hack at major accounting company Deloitte. Irene Lazari, thank you for joining us. You're a friendly hacker from Tel Aviv University. So why is there a spike in cyber attacks and how can we fight them? Part of the reason we're seeing such a massive rise in cyber attacks and also in the impact of these attacks in the past year, it has to do with two things. The first thing is that criminals have really um, grasped the potential they have on using cyber attacks to generate money, to generate revenue, uh, with especially what we call ransomware. These are the types of viruses that encrypt the content of your computer or your computer systems and require a ransom, a payment in Bitcoin to receive access to your files. And criminals have really understood and they really realized the potential of this in 2015 and 2016. And in 2017, it became a global epidemic. So that's one reason we're seeing more of these attacks and we're seeing more attacks that are devastating because they are widely spread. The second thing is that what many of us at home, private individuals and citizens, don't always realize, the reality is that for the past seven or perhaps even 10 years, the world has been in a cold cyber war with many governments and nation states engaging in covert cyber attacks against one another. In the past year, this has come to the surface and we've all had to witness it and realize it, whether the impact it had on the elections in the United States or in France, uh, but also with the release, or I should say the leak of some of the cyber weapons developed originally by the American NSA, leaked and, and used by criminals and hackers all around the world to actually create much more devastating attacks. So what can we do uh, to fight against those threats? Do you think, for example, we should uh, have a Geneva Convention? Well, the idea of creating a global convention against the use of cyber weapons, or rather regulating the use of cyber weapons, is already one which is being discussed. And right now, from the diplomatic and statecraft uh, perspective, some of my friends or colleagues are involved with something called the Wassenauer Agreement, which is bringing to the table politicians to discuss it. Politics and, and state decisions are not my field. What I believe every one of us should do is that as citizens and as consumers, we have to understand cybersecurity is too big of a deal to be left simply to government agencies or to politicians and military generals. It's something that impacts all of us every day. It impacts the safety and trustworthiness of our democratic elections, but also of the hospital systems that we rely on, or the cars and electricity systems in the modern city. So we first of all have to educate ourselves about the threats and the problems. The second thing we can do is make sure that we ourselves at home and in the office are practicing cyber hygiene, that we are not spreading the epidemics. What do you think of a recent ransomware attack? Do you think they were after the money or was there something else behind it? Well, if you're refer referring to the wave of ransomware attacks, which was commonly called WannaCry uh, in last April, this is a very interesting case. It did absolutely create a lot of negative impact for many organizations, not the least of which is the United Kingdom's National Health Service. That's just one example, but also train stations around Germany, and I believe even a Renault Nissan factory in France, which had to stop operations. Was that the goal of the criminals behind that? That's a very good question, and I'm not sure. I have one, one theory about it. When such an attack happens, it definitely takes the headlines, and we all focus on it. There might actually be something else happening at that same time that those attackers didn't want us to notice. So you could consider that such a loud, and such an such a aggressive wave of attack might actually be a deception, a smokescreen to stop the focus and the attention from something much more covert happening, potentially perhaps in a different part of the world even. 
Another interesting aspect to the ransomware um, rise is that you can actually see um, a parallel with the rise in the value of Bitcoin. And that's something very interesting to me because I've also looked at the value of cryptocurrencies and the Bitcoin revolution. So this is a little bit of a conspiracy theory. If you look at the value of Bitcoin, for you, uh, one Bitcoin per US dollar, the week before the first wave of ransomware attacks in, in April. And it was about 1,000 US dollars or 1,200 US dollars for one Bitcoin. But very consistently, since the wave of ransomware attacks, which began in April, and then later in June with the NotPetya wiper attack, which pretended to be a ransomware, but actually was a wiper virus, which is a type of different virus, there was a consistent rise in the value of Bitcoin. And currently, B Bitcoin is about $4,000, or about, about four times what it was just four or five months ago. So I'm not saying that the criminals behind these attacks are also uh, messing around with Bitcoin. The message here is that if they know, uh, the criminals that know that such an attack is going to happen because they are the ones launching it, they can also make a lot of money just by knowing how it will affect market dynamics. The idea is to show you that criminals have non-obvious ways, clever ways, creative ways, to make money from cyber attacks, even if we don't always realize what's their end game. And you yourself are a former hacker, yes. and you call yourself the ambassador of friendly hackers. An unofficial ambassador of the, unofficial. The, uh, the friendly hacker community. And the reality is it's a very big community. Here in France and worldwide, there are hundred, maybe 100,000 friendly hackers around the world. But what you say is that those friendly hackers, they can help uh, fight against they are the already criminal helping. ones. They are already Tell helping. Tell us how, and how can we trust them? So uh, at the moment, friendly hackers around the world have already made you safe and me safe without us even noticing it. This is because some of the biggest companies in the world, primarily companies in Silicon Valley, like Google, Facebook, PayPal, uh, Yahoo, Microsoft, um, to name just a few, have learned to collaborate and actively work with friendly hackers, harness their help in finding software vulnerabilities. Through bug bounties. Ide exactly. Identifying bugs and uh, receiving a reward, a bounty, every time they find something like that. But it's not, a, uh, the, the support of friendly hackers is not just limited to Silicon Valley companies. In the past year, the United States Department of Defense launched a program called Hack the Pentagon. Exactly. Within 13 minutes from opening the program, they already received the first valid report of a bug that they did not know about. Do you think they're inviting trouble in their networks? No. The trouble is already there. What they do you don't, mean? The, the criminals don't need a special invitation. The criminals don't need a bug bounty program. And what about the hackers? And the spies and the terrorists don't need a bug bounty program. They are already in the systems. They are already finding the bugs. The creation of such programs, such incentive programs, is actually actively encouraging the friendly hackers who had never before had a legitimate legal alternative to go ahead with their research and actually help make the world safer. I'm especially excited to look at uh, bug bounty programs, not just in Europe or in the United States, in countries like in Southeast Asia, like India and other countries, in the Philippines, for example, in Africa, in Latin America. Some of these countries uh, don't actually have any alternatives for people who are, like me, curious about security, are finding bugs and vulnerabilities. There's no way for them to work legitimately in this kind of business and get paid without being a criminal. Never before had there been an alternative. And that's why bug bounty programs are a very significant way to make all of us safer by creating that alternative to the criminal lifestyle and the criminal path of a hacker. Because in the dark web, you can earn large sums of money uh, if you sell cyber weapons or if you find zero days. Uh, yes, not just in the dark web. It's true that in the criminal underground and on the dark web, uh, you can make a lot of money or a lot of bitcoins by engaging in the development and sales or simply even just in the trafficking of stolen vulnerabilities, criminal software, Trojan horses, uh, zero days, etc. This is true. It is my point of view and of many other researchers who are looking at the market dynamics of vulnerability research that bug bounty programs are one way to disrupt 
the criminal marketplaces, change the value, change the way that they do business. If a criminal has, or let's say a hacker, not just a criminal, let's say, let's say a hacker finds a vulnerability and now they have the legitimate legal opportunity to disclose the vulnerability and get paid, there many times the fact is this is the reality we're seeing. They will choose the legal option. How much are we talking about? Docker well, versus well, bug some, bounties? So, some of the bug bounty programs uh, pay out up to $30,000, $50,000 per one valid submission. And some of the top bug bounty hunters, they make a very good living simply by becoming the expert bug hunters. And that's what they do. And it can change their lives from being an unemployed hacker to being somebody with a great line of work that's making you and me safer every day. Thank you very much, Karen Lazari.